We are in the book of Philippians chapter 2, this epistle of Paul the Apostle. We've made our way all the way to verse 12, is where we're going to pick up and we'll take some time this morning and, and kind of make our way through verse 18. That's, that's, the, that's the plan. We'll see if we get there. As Paul has written this epistle while he's in a jail cell in Rome, and he is writing to a church that he had great love for. He had founded this church. They were supporters of the apostle in his missionary journeys. And now, while he's in a jail cell, they had sent additional support to help him through some of the most difficult times that he had experienced. And he saw them as, as partners. He saw them as, as um, you know, fellow laborers. He, he, he calls them you know, those that, that are um, with him in the battle, right? He's going to mention that a couple times at the end of this, of this epistle. And there's a theme that he incorporated into this book, and it's found in every chapter, and it was joy. He's going to talk about rejoicing and joy. And, and he, it, it was in the middle of, you know, what you and I would call uh, a bad circumstance or a, a circumstance to cause grief. It was a, Paul saw it as, a, as an opportunity to produce joy. And, and what brought Paul joy was that Jesus was being glorified. He would tell us in, in verse 18 of chapter 1, he says, What then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is preached. And in this I rejoice, yes, and I will rejoice. You see, it, 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 was, it was Paul saying, I, I'm in a jail cell, but Jesus' name is being magnified as a result of it. And, and that's my goal in life. My goal is to bring glory to him, that his name be magnified in, in any way that God sees fit. And because that's happening, I, I, am, I am joyful because of it. He would go on and... The, the second thing that, that he would mention is, is that this relationship that he had with the Philippians, this, this church that had stood by him and that he loved dearly, that, that this thing was still going strong, and that brought him joy. Look, look, look at verse 25 and verse 26 as we just kind of <clears throat> are reminded of kind of his, his purpose. Watch this. Being confident of this, I know that I shall remain and continue with you all for your progress and joy of faith and your rejoicing for me be, may be more abundant in Jesus Christ by the coming of, to you again. And he's saying, look, we, we feed off of each other. Our joy comes because of our relationship with one another. Right, and, and think, think about this, guys, you know, that Jesus' name is being glorified, that we have brothers and sisters that we have bonds with and fellowship with, that, that that should be what produces joy in our lives. That we have a purpose for being here and, and that God is working out these things for his glory. And then he would go on and tell them in chapter 2, verse 2, he would say, fulfill my joy. By being like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord and of one mind. He says, the, the, the only thing that can bring me more joy is if you guys, as the body of Christ, would just continue to, to stay united, to be of one mind, to be of one spirit, to be of one accord, because then God's kingdom is going to be impacted. And that, that, that brings joy when the, the kingdom of God is being uh, you know, strengthened, that the kingdom of God is being added to, that God is working here on earth. And, and, and all of the things that brought this apostle joy should be the very same things that would bring us joy. Because we understand that, that as we're in a world that's, that, that's and he's going to explain it here in, in verse 15, we're in, a, we're in a wicked, we're in a crooked, and we're in a perverse generation. And because of it, you, 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 you and I are, are, have a role to play in all of this. And he's going to explain that 
you know, the life that we've been called to live is a life of humility, it's a life of self-sacrifice, it's a life of servanthood. And in those things, there's joy. And, and he's, he explains that in, in this passage. Matter of fact, remember, remember what he said in verse 3? Let, this, let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. Let each look out not only for his own interest, but also for the interest of others. You know, he's saying, look, we're not here for self. We're here, we're here to, to glorify God, and we glorify God by loving others. We glorify God by, by being obedient to the Lord, by taking the place of humility in, in, in this world. And then he uses Jesus as the ultimate example of it. He takes Jesus' life and, and, and he says, let me, let me show you someone who actually lived out that kind of a life. And he would tell us there in verse 5, let nothing be done I'm sorry, let, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but he made himself of no reputation. He took the form of a bondservant. He came in the likeness of men and being found in appearance as a man. Here it is. He humbled himself and he became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. He says, it's, here's, here's, here, here's someone who was in the highest position possible. He was, he was in the very form of God. And then he emptied himself. And he became a man. And he became obedient to the Father, even to the point of death. And he, and he says, not, not just death, not just any death, but the death of the cross, which, which would have been the most humiliating, excruciating death that could ever be given. And it's here that, that he says, because of it, therefore, there's a first therefore we find in this chapter, and he says, therefore, or the second therefore that is, but it's therefore... God has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name. That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow, those in heaven, those on earth, those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus, is, Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And what, what he's declaring is, look, Jesus lived a life of self-sacrifice, and the result was as he was elevated, he was exalted, and he brought glory to God because of it. And the whole purpose of him bringing Jesus into this picture was so that you and I would see that the way Jesus brought glory to God is the same way that you and I are to bring glory to God. By living that life of humility, the life of obedience, and you'll be exalted, you'll, you'll, you'll be elevated in, in heaven's eyes, not in this world's eyes, but in heaven's eyes. And then he tells us in that same passage here that God got all the glory for it. And you, you and I are here not to somehow elevate ourselves, but to elevate God, not to promote ourselves, but to promote God. And then, guys, here it is, verse 12. This is where we left off. He goes to that word, therefore. Anytime you see the word, therefore, he's saying, look, because of this, that, that, that's what he's saying, you know, or, or as a result of what Jesus did, I, I'm going to give you now the application to what it is that you're to do. He says, therefore, my beloved. Notice Paul's affection for this church, my beloved. That, that's, a, that's a term of endearment, you know. Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. And it's, a, it's, an, incredible, it's an incredible exhortation that he's giving the church of Philippi. He says, you, you, I, I'm, I'm, not going, I'm talking obedience, not just when I'm watching, not just when I'm there with you, but even in my absence. Because he wanted to remind them they're not doing what they were doing for Paul. They weren't doing it because they had some kind of respect for the apostle. They were doing it because of Christ. 
I mean, so, so, so many people get caught up in, you know, th this idea of what people think about me or, or I'm going to do it whenever someone I, I respect is around me. I remember the Pharisees, Jesus rebuked them over and over again. Because they, they, were, they were what Jesus identified as men pleasers. Whenever people were watching, they, they would do the right things, but behind closed doors, they, they wouldn't. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 6, he says, Take heed that you do not do charitable deeds before men to be seen by them. Otherwise, you'll have no reward from your Father in heaven. Therefore, when you do a charitable deed, do not sound the trumpet before you as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may have glory from men. Assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward. Jesus said, don't, don't, don't do it just because I'm watching you. Doing it because, because God's with you, because God's watching you. And as a reminder to them is, is that, is that they, they, they would be those who, not just in his presence, but in his absence, and, and, and as, as though he is telling them, look, that's what you guys have been doing. You notice how he says, you have always obeyed. Not just when I'm there, not just when I'm watching, but even in my absence. And that you work out your own salvation with fear and with trembling. Now what he's not saying in this passage, and some have misinterpreted this passage, to say work for your salvation. That's, that's not what he's declaring here at all. Matter of fact, we're, we're going to see that that's, that's directly opposite of what he's saying. We, we know that, that Ephesians, and I think Ephesians, this is really a commentary on Ephesians chapter 2. We, we just covered the book of Ephesians, but in the 8th verse, we're told in uh, the book of Ephesians chapter 2, for by grace you've been saved through faith. But watch this. That not of yourself, it's a gift of God. And then he even takes it further, not of works, lest anyone should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Right? And, and, and what, what Paul is telling the Ephesians, look, understand something. You didn't save yourself. You, wasn't, you didn't work your way to salvation. God gave you a gift. But now you need to work out that salvation that you've obtained and lived this Christian life that God has called you to. That, that's the idea here. You've been saved. You put your faith in Jesus Christ. You acknowledge that you're a sinner, that you need a savior. You say, God, I, I don't want to live for me any longer. I want you to come in and live inside of me. And you've come to this position in your life where you have surrendered to Christ. Now you're saved. But now you need to work out that salvation. In other, in other words, begin to live out what God intended for you. With fear and with trembling. What, 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 a, what a great perspective that, you know, that, man, God saved me. He's rescued me from me and from this world and from the devil. And now I, 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 I want to go out and I want to live out this life that he's given to me for the, the furtherance of his kingdom. And that, that's, that's the exhortation that Paul is giving the Philippians. I like how this word is defined, that word work out, katergazome, to perform, to accomplish, to achieve, to do that from which something results. Weston, his commentary says, to carry out the goal, to carry out its ultimate conclusion. He would also say, it carries with it the idea of getting the most out of something. When we say he is working the mine or he's working the field, we know that he is working to get the most out of the mine or the field. A miner's ultimate goal is to not leave the mine without any stone of value. That, that, that's how this is defined. Work out your salvation. In other words, go and use what 
God has entrusted to you to the greatest ability that he's given you. Work out your salvation. Take it to its ultimate end. Don't leave anything unfinished. Don't leave anything undone in this work that God has for you. And ultimately, his goal is to conform you into the image of his son. Christian, you, you were saved to be conformed into the image of Christ. And you and I are, are in this process of sanctification. We're in this process where God saves us. He, he knows how messed up you are. You're not surprising him. <laughs> I was like, oh man, I thought I had got something better. He goes, no, I know what I got. He knows exactly what, what he's working with. He knows all of your, 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 your quirks. He knows all, all of your, your, your tendencies. He knows all of your failures. And, and it's this process of him making you more and more and more like him day by day. And he's saying, you have to work it out. It's, it, it does, it's not just some magic potion. You see, hopefully you become more like Christ this week than you were last week. And you become more like Christ this month than you were last month. And then you become more like Christ this year than you were last year. It's this working out, this salvation that God has for your life. How do I do that? How, how, how's that possible? Well, look, look what he says in the very next verse. For it is God who works in you. Both, check this out, to will and to do for his good pleasure. It is God who works in you. Guys, this isn't you drumming it up in your own might or power. You, you see, any, anything that you have that's in you that desires God is because God put it there. You didn't just wake him and go, I think I'll become a Christian today. You didn't do that. I promise you that. <laughs> I think I'll change my life. No, you didn't do that. You see, God placed that hunger in you. He placed that desire in you. You wouldn't even be here this morning at church if God didn't put that desire in you to do so. You see, God's the one who initiates all of this. It's God working in you. And he had been working in you. That moment you realized, man, I, I, I am messed up. I need, I need a savior. That, that was God bringing that to your attention. Whenever you, you realize of some action that you're taking that, that's wrong and, and, it, and it comes to your attention that's wrong and you, you, you repent of it. That's because God was working in you. God's working in you. And he's still working in you. I mean, the, 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 you know, the, the things, there's times where, where I say things and I'm like, Lord, I, I'm so sorry. I mean, before, even if it's coming out of my mouth, I get convicted. Uh, you've ever had that? You're just like, you're saying it and you're going, what am I saying? <laughs> Almost, almost like instantaneously, the Holy Spirit's trying to hold it in and your flesh is saying, I want to let it out. And there's this war that goes on right there. And then, you know, as soon as you do it, you know, oh man, I, I, I blew it. And the only reason you know you blew it is because God's working in you. The work of the Holy Spirit working in you. And he's placing things in your heart. He's placing things in your life, the things that, that God is putting in your life to, you know, to, to serve him, to, to love others. You know? And, and you, you can just kind of listen to it and ignore it, or you can act upon it. And when you act upon it, it's because God gave you the power to act upon it. Because God, God energizes you. That, that, that's the word that he's going to use this here, where he says that God worketh in you. Let me, let me read you another section out of, out of Weiss. I let, Weiss on this, on this passage, man, was, just blew my mind. Watch what he says. The word worketh in the Greek means to energize, to work effectively. Our words energy and energize come from this word. The word to will 
are the translation of a Greek word meaning to desire. And it, reverse, it refers to a desire that comes from one's emotion rather than one's reason. It is the desire to do the good pleasure of God that is produced in divine energy in the heart of the saint as he definitely subjects himself to the Holy Spirit's ministry. It is God, the Holy Spirit, who energizes the saint, makes him not only willing, but actively desirous of doing God's sweet will. But he does not merely leave the saint with the desire to do his will. He provides the necessary power to do it. This is what we have in the word to do. The Greek construction implies a habit, the habitual doing of God's will. In verse 12, we have human responsibility. In verse 13, divine en enablement. A perfect balance which must be kept if the Christian life is to be lived at its best. It's not a let go and let God affair. It's a take hold with God business. Here we have the incomprehensible and mysterious interaction between the free will of man and the sovereign grace God, I love that. You see here, it's not, it's not you and I just, just, just coming to this place where we're saying, well, I'm just going to, I'm just going to pray. I'm just going to pray. No, pray, then act. Right? Pray, then do. And, and, and he's encouraging the, the, the church, you know, go out and live your Christian life the way God intended that Christian life to live. And you can't do it without him, so he's going to give you the energy to do it. And that's what you and I have been called to. I, I, you know, I, I think of so many men in the Bible that, that I look to in, in this fashion. I think, think of Daniel serving under how many wicked kings. And yet, and yet Daniel didn't compromise. He, did, he, didn't, he didn't waver. Matter of fact, they said, Daniel, bow down. Uh, or, or he said, Daniel, don't pray. And if you pray, you know, you're, you're, you're going to get fed to lions. And he says, you know what, I'm going to pray anyway. You, you do what you got to do, I'm going to do what I got to do, right? He, he stood up for what he knew to be true. And even though he was under this, this you know, authority of a king, he wasn't going to compromise his convictions. And as a result, God delivered him. Think, think, think about what, what, what an incredible picture that is. Now, I don't think Daniel had the, it's just Daniel was just a brave guy. No, I think God gave him the power to do what he did. So that God gets all the glory when it happens. And it's, and it's, an, it's an amazing picture because you see, God has given to every one of us a certain measure of faith. He's given us all a you know, certain amount of giftings, every one of us. It's not, it's not your ability, it's, it's your obedience. That, that's, that's what God's looking for, your obedience. You humble yourself and you say, God, I, I don't know how to do this, but I'm, I'm going to obey you if you tell me to. I'll do it. I'll do whatever you ask me to do. When Paul was writing to the Romans in chapter 12, in the third verse, he says, For I say, through the grace given to me, to everyone who is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, check this out, as God has dealt to each one a measure of faith. Even the faith you have has been dealt to you. <laughs> He's dealt to each one a measure of faith. So they're like, well, I'm just, you know, more faithful. No, you're not. No, you're not. God gave you the faith. <laughs> when, he, when he was writing to the to Corinthians in 2 Corinthians 3, 5, he says, not that we're sufficient of ourselves to think anything of being from ourselves, but our sufficiency is from God. I like that. Paul's saying, look, we're nobody. I'm not, I don't have the ability to do what God's called me to do, the sufficiency I possess, because God made me sufficient. That's the only place I can find it. In Hebrews chapter 13, I love this one, verse 20, in verse 21, he says, Now may the God of peace who brought up our Lord Jesus from the dead, that great shepherd of the sheep, 
through the blood of the everlasting covenant make you complete in every good work to do his will. Watch this. Working in you what is well pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. You see, it's God who does the work. You have to work it out. God does the work. You have to obey. You, you have to say, God, I, I, I'm willing to do what it is that you've called me to do, and, and you make yourself available to that. And if God begins to put something in your heart in some area of service or some, something that you think, man, I can't do that, that then it's probably God. <laughs> Because you realize, I can't do it. Good, you can't do it. Now you get it. (laughs) You can't do it. But God can. Are you willing to yield yourself? Are you willing to, to, you know, and I think that's what he's calling the Philippian believers here. He's saying, look, work it out. Fulfill what God intended for your life. How does that happen? is, Is you understand that God's the one who gave you the will to do it, and God will give you the energy or the power or the ability to do what he's called you to do. Guys, I, I, I think that it, it's an incredible exhortation for us in the days that you and I are living in. What, what, what an exhortation that, you know what, God, God has put it in your heart to do what you're doing right now. Sitting, listening to his word. God put that in your heart. You're, you're, you're here because God initiated that with you. And, and now you, you, you work that out and you, you take what the things that God has placed in your heart and now you begin to live them out. Not, not, not just at church, but now at home, in your marriage. Not, not just at church, but in your workplace, with your family, with your friends, wherever, wherever you find yourself, that, that you're now you know, being what God has called you to be amongst them. He didn't call you to be a Christian on Sundays. He called you to be a Christian 24 7, 365. That, that he's calling you. And I love the next verse. Watch, watch, watch what he says. It's God who works in you, it's God who does all of these things. The, the idea is, is, that, is that God has begun this work and now you have to walk out this, this work. Matter of fact, remember what he said in, before I jump to the next verse? Remember what he said in, in verse, uh, chapter 1, verse 6, where he says, being confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. I mean, that, that was Paul's confidence. God's going to finish what he started. He's going, to get, he's going to finish what he started in your life. You in cooperation, you in obedience, you, you coming and saying, Lord, I, I just want to be where you want me to be. I'll humble myself. I'll, I'll, I'll take that lower position. I'll do whatever you've asked me to do. And, and in doing so, you become an obedient servant. And God begins to work through you. He begins to work in you. He, be, he begins to give you the, the power to accomplish the things he's called you to do. And it's there in verse, verse 14. He says, do all things. Now, I want you to underline the word all there. Because it's, it's, it's an important word. <laughs> do all things without complaining and disputing. Interesting word. The, the word um, complaining there is also translated murmuring. It's a secret displeasure not openly avowed. It's, it's that little voice in the head that says, you know what? I don't have to do that. <laughs> It's the same word that, that was spoken of the children of Israel when they, were, when they were taken out of Egypt. Remember, they were murmuring and complaining. They were murmuring when they were slaves. They, got mur- they were murmuring when they got delivered from slavery. They were murmuring whenever they didn't get the food that they wanted. They, at first, they murmured they, they didn't have food, and then God gave them manna, and then they're murmuring about the manna. And then they were murmuring because they wanted meat. They, they, I mean, you know, they, they, were, they, were, they, they murmured for 40 years. <laughs> no matter what happened, you know, like, 
that's, that's not fair. And he's saying, you know what, do all things without murmuring. And, and that's, in your, that's in your mind. Because that's where it all begins. If you're murmuring in your mind, it's just a matter of time before you start complaining to others. And, and, he, and he, he uses those words side by side because the word disputing that he uses here in, in the Greek, it, it, it's, it's that word that we find, um, you know, complaining and disputing. The, the, the word disputing is the word a deliberating, a questioning about what is true, a hesitation. It's a doubting. And this is more of an outward declaration, not, not just an inward And it, it, it didn't take long for the murmuring to turn into disputing. He says, do all things without murmuring and disputing. In, in other words, that they, they, they were to do it willfully. They were to do it as bond servants. They were to do it because, look, this is what God's asked me to do. And, and uh, wh why would I complain about what God's asked me to do? Why am I murmuring? If God has put me in this situation, why, why am I disputing that? Why am I, why am I complaining about that? He says that you do all things without complaining and disputing. It was also, I think, a reminder of, of the children of Israel because who were they murmuring against? Remember, remember Moses? They, you know, Moses, why did you bring us out here? You know, Moses, why did you, you know, why, how come we're going to die out here? I mean, why, why? There's no food. And, and you, you know, always has something to, to say about the leadership of Moses. They are always complaining and murmuring about Moses. And, and, and it was, it was, it was uh, here, Paul, just saying, look, guys, we, we'll never be uh, united. We'll never be of one accord. We'll never be able to accomplish God's purpose in our lives if, if we're murmuring and complaining, if we're disputing with one another. And you'll never be united together in this venture that God has you on. And so he reminds them that not to be complaining, not to be disputing, but look at verse 15, that you may become blameless and harmless children of God without fault in the midst of a crooked and a perverse generation among whom you shine as lights in the world. Wow. That God has called us to be blameless. He's called, he's called you and I to, to be those who um, are, are, are harmless, that, 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 that we're w without fault, that, that others aren't looking at us. They see you murmuring and complaining against God. They see you murmuring and complaining against, you know, God's kingdom or God's church or God's people. Then, you know, they look at you like, man, well, why, why would I want to be part of what you're doing if, if that's who your God is or that's what your people do? Or is that, you know, he said, man, you, you want to be blameless and faultless in the midst of a crooked world. We, 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 we need to maintain unity. We need to maintain singleness of mind and heart together because if we're murmuring and complaining against one another, then what, what does that declare to a world that's murmuring and complaining against everything? That there's not, nothing different between what you have and what I have. And so you, you and I, you know, with this one heart, one mind going, man, I, I'm, I'm under God's rule. I'm under God's authority. God's the one who's worked in me. God's the one who's going to work out these things. He's going to give me the energy, the power to fulfill what he's called me to do. And so your, your, your real authority is God. Come on under his rule. Come under his authority. And I, and, I, and I love that he reminds us that, yay, we're, we're in a crooked and a perverse world. <laughs> I'll tell you what, guys, it, we're at the, at the height of it right now, aren't we? Some of the things that, that, are, that are happening in our culture, I, 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 I didn't even think happened underground, <laughs> to be quite honest with you. I, 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 now it's mainstream. Now, now it's just blatantly out there. There's no hiding it. As a matter of fact, they're celebrating it. They, 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 are, they are proud of what they're doing against God. We're in a wicked and perverse generation. And, and it's, 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 
it, it's it's not even you know innocence is something that that our, our society doesn't even consider our children they're going after our kids like never before it's the new trend is is to take children to go watch transgender men dance around in sexually provocative dancing right and you're just like who who in their right mind would take a, a five-year-old a seven-year-old to to do these that, that that's the result of a culture that takes god out of it that, that's what's happening so there's no moral norms there there, there there's no rule to to to, to gauge just whatever you want to do just go for it that's a culture you and i are living in everyone's doing what's right in their own eyes because god is not going to be the measuring stick any longer it's crooked and perverse and and, and you know what I, and i i'm going to encourage you guys don't just watch what abc and cbs and nbc are going to feed you Go, go outside and, and look at what's really going on because they're, not, they're never going to tell you what's really going on. They, they want you to be in the dark of what's really happening in our culture right now. So you've you got, you got to find some alternative. There's websites out there that, that man, I, I, I'm, I'm just like, they're, they're just reporting, not opinionating, and you can find the reporting. And you're, you're, you're going to vomit like I'm vomiting, just like, you know, weeping. I, I, I mean, I, I, I haven't cried watching this stuff more than I have in these last few months. It just, it's just vulgar and evil. And that's the world that you and I live in right now. And, it, and it's heartbreaking. Watch an interview with a woman, and I don't want to get too diverted here, but I watched an interview with a woman, and, and they're asking her, you know, at what point it, it, does a woman have the right to, to, to discard her child? They said, there is no point. And they're talking about abortion after birth now. That, that, that's, that's on the table now. That, that's, the, that's a conversation now. You can have the child and six months after the child's born that you as a mother have the right to discard that child and kill it. That, that's, that's just, I mean, how, how did we get there? You just take God out. That's all you gotta do. Because the only thing that shines light in a world is God. You know, the, the, only, the only reason you and I have any sense of right and wrong is because God has told us what right and wrong is. And we're living in that world right now where we've excluded God, but this is, this is the cool thing. You shine as a light in the world, Christian. That's what he's telling you. You're the light that, that, that illuminates that, that where this world is heading is darkness. You see, all, all it takes is for darkness to, to, to prevail is for the light to be taken out. That's all it takes. We got rid of the sun, we'd be in darkness all the time. Right? It just, that, that's all it takes is, is you, you, get, you get the light out of the picture and darkness invades. But you shine as a light in the world in other words your presence your testimony your 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 voice what you stand for what what, what you represent is what illuminates the world and and i think that's why the world hates us even more is because the light exposes darkness and the darkness doesn't want light. And so if they can snuff out the light, then they won't have to deal with the conviction. They don't have to deal with the knowledge that, that you know, or, or the awareness, because I think they know, but now they become aware that what they're doing is evil and wrong. 
and you're to shine as a light in the world. I like how, how Daniel uses that, that term in, in Daniel chapter 12, verse 3. He says, those who are wise shall shine like the brightness of the firmament. And those who turn many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. Isn't that a cool passage? Those who turn many to righteousness will shine like the firmament forever and ever, like the stars. And all we're doing is, you think about the, the stars don't produce the light. All they do is reflect the light. The moon doesn't produce light. It just reflects light. And all you and I are, 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 are reflectors. <laughs> We're just, we're, just, we're just shining forth the light that God's provided us. He, he's the one who energizes us. He's the one who's, who's illuminating from us because his spirit's living inside of us. And so you and I have been called to be the light. And all you're doing is reflecting Christ. Reflecting love and grace and mercy and truth. And you're, 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 you're to go out and, and not... Let the world influence what you say or what you believe or how you live your life. That you come and you say, man, I, I, th th this is going to be what guides my, my course, my life. The word of God. Well, and we'll, we'll get to that here shortly because he's, he's going to bring that up. Jesus uses the same terminology in Matthew chapter 5 and verse 14. Jesus says this, You're, you are the light of the world. A city that's set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do they light a lamp or they put it under a basket, but on a lampstand. It gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that, when, that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. That, that, that's, that's what you and I have been called to do. That they may see your good works. that they would glorify your Father in heaven. And I think that's exactly what Paul is encouraging the, the, the Philippians here, that, that they would see your good works, that your light would shine because you are, are, are staying the course. You're not wavering. Paul, when he was writing to the Ephesians in chapter 5, verse 8, he says, For you were once darkness, but now you are light, and the Lord walk as children of light. He said the very same thing to the Ephesians. You were once darkness. You, 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 you were once lost. You, you, were, you were once dead. You, you were once going the same path that the rest of the world was going. But now you are a light in the world, in, in the Lord. Walk as children of light. Not murmuring, not complaining, not, not, not disputing, you know, not being blameless before, the, before men, being blameless before God. You know, that, that you're, you're just like, man, I, I'm here to fulfill a purpose. I, I, I have a, a reason to be here. And you're not letting this world conform you. I mean, uh, Ephesians chapter 12, where it says, and, and, you know, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is the good and the acceptable and the perfect will of God. I mean, that, that, again, I think it's the same thing in, in, in another, uh, you know, another verbiage, and, 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 you know, saying the same thing in another, in another way. In Romans, as, as he's saying to the Philippians, as he said to the Ephesians, that it's God who gives you the power to do what you do. It, it, it's the Holy Spirit working in your life so that you can accomplish God's purposes and God's plan. Knowing that you can't do this on your own. I can't do this on my own. You, you know, it, it's amazing because, you know, every time I got to walk up these stairs, I, my prayer is, God, give me the right words because I don't know what I'm going to say. I've studied my, you know, for, for hours on end, but God, unless you empower me, I, I, it's going to bomb. It's going to fall on deaf ears. It's, you know, it's going to be a waste of time. God, don't let that happen. Would you ignite these words so that you can get the glory and your church can be edified and equipped? And you, you see, guys, it, it, it's all about the Holy Spirit enabling and empowering. I can't do what God's called me to do unless the Holy Spirit enables me. And you can't do what God's called you to do unless the Holy Spirit enables you. We've all been called to serve him. 
We've all been called to use the gifts that he's given us. And it's all for his glory. You see, well, we're, we're going to wrap it up in verse 16 and, and watch what he says. Holding fast the word of life. Let's stop there. Holding fast the word of life. And, and it's again an exhortation where he's encouraging the church to hold on to the word. Who's the word? Jesus. He's the word of life. In the beginning was the word, the word was with God, and the word was God. And he's asking us to hold on to the word of life. That same word that spoke the universe into being can release divine power in our lives. And, and, and I, think, I think the idea is it's the word of life. You know, if the words of life are, 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 are you know, provided to us. You, you, you cannot know God's will unless you're in God's word. It's just as simple as that. You, you will never know the will of God unless you're spending time in the word of God. Because that's where life is. Remember Hebrews 4, 12? For the word of God is living and it's powerful and it's sharper than a two-edged sword. It divides between the bone, the marrow, between the soul and the spirit. And it reveals the thoughts, the intents of the heart. It's just the word of God that's living. It's the word of God that, that, that is, is igniting within us along with the spirit of God so that you're able to know the will of God. And as you have the spirit of God and the word of God, you know, being poured into your life and, and igniting inside of your life, then you're, you're, you're going to be someone who's, you know, ready to do the things that God has empowered you to do. Energized. And I think his encouragement to them as well is, is in, in, that, in that one passage is, is simply that they were to hold on to it. They were to hold fast. Think, think about it, to hold fast to the word of life. Don't, don't, don't waver here. Don't, don't, don't buckle here. You need to understand something that this isn't the word of man. This is the word of God. It's the word of God. It, it's, it's not, this isn't the, 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 some attempt of man to tell you about God. This is God revealing himself to you. That, that's his word. And I like what he wrote to the Thessalonians in chapter 2, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, in verse 13. And it, this, this is his commend, commending them. He says, for this reason, we also thank God without ceasing, because when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you welcomed it not as the word of men, but it as it is in truth, the word of God, which also, here it is, effectively works in you who believe. I like that. It's the word of God. It effectively works in you who believe. And he's telling them, hold fast to the word of life. Don't, 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 don't let go. Don't, don't get duped. That somehow that's, it, it's, you know, old fashioned, Victorian. It's, it's you know, that, 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 was, that was good for another culture, but not good for this culture. No, that, that's a lie. Hold fast to the word of life. It's, it's living, it's powerful, it's now, it's, it's working. And then look, watch, and we'll, we'll wrap it up right here at the end of verse 16. So that I may rejoice in the day of Christ that I may have not run in vain or have labored in vain. And Paul says, look, guys, you, you, you hold on to these things. And when we get to heaven together, man, we're, we're going to see all of the fruit that God wants to produce. That I, that I haven't labored in vain, that I, 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 haven't, I haven't, you know, poured out my life, and he's going to talk about that, and we won't get there this morning, but he goes, my life is being poured out like a drink offering. He goes, that, that it wasn't for nothing that I did that, that, that it wasn't for, for naught that I did that, but it was because I, I, I poured into you so that you can, you, can, you can grow and mature, and then you can pour into others, and then they grow and mature, and then they pour into others, and, and, then, and then God is, is just being, um, you know, elevated throughout the society, throughout the culture. 
throughout our families, throughout our friends, throughout our, our, our you know, circles that, that we run in, that, that, that God is able to accomplish great things because he's taken these lives and he's used them for his glory. And that my, my, my prayer, you know, I, I, I love this, this passage because he's, look, I, when, I, when I get to heaven, I don't want it to be for naught that I did all of this. I want, I, want it, I want it to be for God's glory. I want to see you guys elevated. I, I want to see you guys putting fruit to your account. I want to see you guys magnified, exalted because of what God has worked in you. And he brings up the day of Christ again. But Paul had a, a fixation on the day of Christ. I, I love it. He goes like, we're going to be there one day. It's, 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 it's a given. It, we're going to be before our Lord one day. And when that happens, I, 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 I want to see what God's done in your lives. And, and may that be what you and I live our lives for. I, I, I want to stand before God one day and, and just, if I could just hear the words, well done. Well done. Good and faithful servant, you did what I've asked you to do. If I could hear those words, then it's, it's all good. Right? <laughs> if I hear those words, you know, and, and, and that, that, that would be why you and I do what we do. Because I, I want to please him. I, wanna, I, want, I want God to be happy with the life that I lived. Everything else can fall apart, but if, if that happens, then, then it's success. And that your life would be lived with success as well. For the glory of God, for the kingdom of heaven. That you'd be a light in the midst of this dark perverse, crooked, wicked world. And that God would get all the glory. Father, we love you. We're so thankful, God. Thank you full for what you've accomplished in us, Lord. And we would have never responded to you had you not initiated by your spirit, convicting us of our need. And God, we, we know that, Lord, that same way, God, you, you, you want us to be obedient to you, Lord. In our calling, in our, in our, in our decision-making, in our, in, our, in our everyday activity. Now, God, we would, we would be just available servants that your will would be what we long for, God. Not to please men, not, not, not to elevate self, but God, to please you and to elevate you. And so God, I, I just pray that your spirit, as we're going through this book of Philippians, what an incredible, incredible reminder to us that it's all you, God, it's your power. And that we would work out this salvation that you've given us. They would work it out to the fullest extent that we would leave nothing on the table. And that, God, you'd be glorified. Father, I ask that, God, you would move here today. God, that you would, Lord, those things that you've spoken to us, we would take to heart. That the word of life, God, would just be ignited in each of us and that we would just be available for you and for your glory. And so, Father, we thank you for this time. We thank you for this body. We thank you for the work you're doing in this community. Lord, let us be light in the midst of darkness. We give you the praise, God, the honor. We give you the glory. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.